And I want to go ahead and tell you why Jesus has these large crowds following him. You see, he's called his first disciples, and he's began his ministry. And Jesus went through Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. This new kingdom. And he began healing people and re restoring people and everyone wanted to follow him. Why? Because no one has come doing that. He came proclaiming a message, but he also had the power with him to heal, to restore. And so crowds began to form around him and follow him. And so it says that he went when he saw the crowds, he went up to the mountaintop and sat down. It's very significant that Jesus went up to that mountaintop and sat down. Because in that day, rabbis, when they were in the synagogue, did not stand up here like me. We got it backwards. When a rabbi came to teach, he sat and everyone else stood. And it was a posture that they knew as soon as that rabbi sat down, that that rabbi they needed to be paying attention to. And at this point, the disciples had claimed him as their rabbi, and they knew, and I imagine they were scattered amongst, but it says that they came, that they, the disciples came to him and began, he began to teach them. Now, it didn't mean that he just taught the disciples alone. It meant that they were smart enough to know who Jesus was and that he was their rabbi. They had already chosen him as their teacher. And they knew when he took that seat of prominence, and he did it on a mountaintop. So that he could be heard better and seen better. But he sat. He took that seat so they knew. And instantly their conversation stopped. You ever notice on Sunday morning when the music starts playing, we're like, oh, Renee's going to stand up and start announcing soon. We need to get ourselves situated. Well, when he took that seat, they knew they needed to scurry away from their conversations and get to a predominant spot close to him because they didn't want to miss anything. There was no microphones then. There was just the projection of his voice, and they did not want to get lost and lose any of what he was saying in the crowd. Now, see, the crowd was still around, and the crowd was still listening. Jesus didn't tell them to go away. And those who wanted to hear, I imagine, heard. And I imagine there were plenty from down low listening that were hearing a few words here and there. But Jesus starts to preach and teach to them. And he says something right off the bat that if it didn't get your attention, you really weren't listening. Because he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If I was in conversation with Miss Pat or somebody and I heard the preacher start saying that, I'm going to be turned going, what is he talking about? Because that sounds nothing like the world I live in. What do you mean the poor in spirit? Now, let me tell you, he's not talking about poor in the pocketbook and he's not talking about poor in material things. He's talking about poor in our spirit. See, what he is saying at this point is... Those that recognize their need for God. Every single one of us, if we are proclaiming, professing Christians, there's a point in our lives where we recognize we were poor in spirit. There's a moment when we recognize that we did not have enough God in us, enough Holy Spirit in us, that we did not have Christ in our life the way that we needed Him. We've all been poor in spirit, church. And when we recognize that we're poor in spirit is when our blessing happens. Because what happens when we confess that we need Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior? We are redeemed. We are given grace. We are accepted into that kingdom. And he hands us a key to the kingdom himself. See, my daddy and mama, they used to have all of our friends over at the house. And even if we didn't ask, they just all show up. We had a pool and lived in the country and... My parents were always so hospitable and welcoming. And my dad had this thing that he would say to people on your first visit. He would tell you, you're welcome to the house. The bathroom's down the hall. The kitchen's right over there. Any food in the fridge or in the kitchen, you're welcome to. I'm not your maid. I'm not going to clean up after you. Clean up after yourself, and you're welcome here. Instantly, my friends knew that they could eat anything that was there, and they were welcome at home in his house. 
And he would go around on Sunday mornings because we'd all hang out on sa Saturdays too most of the time. We would have people just sleeping all over the place. There would be people's feet hanging out in front of their bedroom door when they'd open up. And they would go around counting heads so they could go to Hardee's or McDonald's and get everybody breakfast biscuits. The hosp hospitality was there. And they knew that the keys to that house was open to them. And that's what Christ is saying in this. He's saying, if you recognize that you need me, if you recognize you need a place, I'm your place. When you recognize you can't do it on your own, I'm the one to help you. This is when you truly inherit the kingdom of heaven. This is your land. This is your home. As soon as you recognize whose house it truly is, it's his. It's God's. Then he goes on, if he didn't get their attention there, he says, blessed are those who mourn. Now, I know when we look at mourning, we think about those we've lost. And, but Jesus is going deeper than that. Jesus is going deeper. He's saying those who, who mourn over social justice issues, mourn over, over people who are broken in sin, mourn over your own sin. See, he's talking about not just mourning over death because Jesus knew the power there was over death. He's talking about true mourning. We live in this country and we see problems and it breaks our heart. We, that is the mourning he's talking about. The injustices, the pain, the sin, the brokenness, the sorrow. Blessed are those who cry over that. We should, church. It's painful to open our eyes and see the world for what it is, but it is the truth. As we recognize whose we are, we have to see the world for who it is. And when we do that, he will comfort us in that pain, but we have to see it. There's no way that you come to know Jesus and love Jesus and you don't see pain of others. Then he goes on to say, blessed are the meek. Now, I want you to know that meek is only spoken of four times in the New Testament altogether. That word meek. It's done twice in Matthew to describe Jesus. And it's also done one in 1 Peter when we're talking about the woman of virtue. See, I think meek is a word that we misunderstand at times. See, meek can mean quiet and gentle and it, and it, it can be soft. But I think what meek really means is strength under pressure and under control. Because here's the thing we notice with Jesus. Jesus could have called all the legions of heaven down to take care of anything he wanted to. But he didn't. He showed us what it looked like to have pure strength and control it. Have you ever been in a situation and you reacted instead of responded. See, Jesus didn't react. Everything was a response to him. At the first church at Woodlawn, um, one of the guys walked up and said, I'm going to use that piece, Pastor, where you talk about reacting versus responding for some of our first responders. And, I, and that got me thinking on the way over here how, I'm, how we call them first responders. They're called first responders for a reason. They're called to come onto a scene where it is chaos and everyone is reacting and to respond. And the heartbreaking pieces is when we see them react instead of respond. That's usually when they end up in the news or in trouble. But see, meekness, when, when Christ is telling his disciples and telling us, blessed are the meek for they inherit the earth. We inherit the earth when we can control our strength. True strength is self-control. True strength is Jesus who can look at his persecutors and still ask God to forgive them. We will not be controlled by people when we can learn meekness. Because I will tell you, there are people who will try to push your buttons I saw a TikTok the other day where it says, my wife pushes my buttons and it runs to this person in the elevator pushing all the buttons. <laughs> People will push your buttons to get you to react. But as Christ followers, we're called to be meek and hold that strength in and to respond correctly or not to. That's true strength, church. 
True strength is when we have that control. And that's when we truly inherit the earth because the earth will no longer control us. We will control it. We will no longer be controlled by people and situations. We will be able to control ourselves with that meekness, that pure strength. And Jesus was the prime example of it. Then he goes on to say, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. I will tell you, if you serve God, you and you do it rightly and justly, God fills you every time. You can't feed someone or help someone and God not bless you. When you truly hunger and thirst for righteousness, and I, I don't mean just pointing out wrongdoings of others. Please, that ain't it. Righteousness is both justification and sanctification. Righteousness is when we know that we are not righteous enough, that the only righteous true one is Christ, and we give our life to him. Because we're poor in spirit. And then that sanctifying place, place, that sanctification, where we begin to try to walk like Jesus. Y'all, it's hard. Those are some big shoes and we'll never fill them. But we sure try to walk in his path. We start practicing meekness and we'll fail. But we got to try. We'll grieve for those. And in that righteousness, we have this desire for people to, to know Christ, to know what it's like to be filled with, with forgiveness and grace and mercy. You see, we can't sit by at that point and see injustice and not pray about it or ask Christ to come in and help us figure out how to change it. That's why, that's why we have to speak, church. When we see something wrong, we have to respond accordingly when the world around us is reacting to it all. Then he goes on to say, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Many of you in here have felt the mercy of Christ before. We have felt what it's like to be the recipient of grace and when you receive that kind of grace, you can't help but want others to receive it too. But the one I want to focus on for a little bit is blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. I want to read for you a quote from, from a Scottish theologian who works at a I worked at a seminary, and I, when I came across it the other day, I thought, I've got to share this with the church. His name is Sinclair Ferguson, and he said, let me get it. Y'all know you, Pastor, take a second with this technology business. But I took a picture because I was like, y'all know I just read out of my, my, my Bible, so. All right. So Sinclair Ferguson put it this way. Great things can can be completely obstructed by small things if small things are brought too near enough to our eyes. We see that this world has nothing to compare to Jesus and all that he offers us. But when we hold this world and its contents too near, we no longer see Christ and his glory so clearly. I think for us to have a pure heart and to see God means that we have to be looking past everything else and focused on Him. You and I both know I can't see this side of the room if I do this. What we focus on, when we, whatever we hold near and dear, can sometimes be the distraction from us seeing, the, seeing God. And I think as Christians, we should recognize the fact that, that we've received kingdoms to a kingdom, keys to a kingdom that has given us a new heart. Do you know that scripture tells us that we will receive a new heart? Do you know that Ezekiel prophesied about that new, new heart for us? I want you to hear this from Ezekiel and the way that he puts it. And for those of you who want to write it down, it's chapter 36. And I'm going to verse 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. 
I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And the way the New Testament or the New Living Translation puts it is even better. And I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. I will put my spirit in you. Christ is saying that he wants, he's going to give us a new heart. A new heart that will help us to see God more clearly. A new heart that will help us love differently. A new heart that will help us be more meek. The new heart that will make us weep for our own sin and the sin of this world and others. A new heart that will rejoice like I talked about last week. We will rejoice with heaven when someone comes to understand how poor in spirit they are and accept Christ as their Lord and Savior. Christ is putting so much meat and potatoes in the Beatitudes. And we know that the Beatitudes are, are formed. We got the word from the word blessing and it just keeps going, but... I love the word beatitude. I don't think Jesus knew when he, or when the scholars did this, they knew I was going to butcher it this way. But I think we can be in an attitude like this. I think we're called to be in an attitude like this. One that's seeking righteousness. One in an attitude going, where can I be meek today? Where can I restrain my strength? Where can I have a pure heart and love like God? I want to see God, church. I want to see God everywhere I go. I want the eyes of Christ. I don't want anything blocking it. And I will tell you, I start the day off going, God, give me your eyes to see your ears, to hear your heart, to love. And you know what happens first thing? Something blocks it. I got up this morning to come to church and I was like ready, y'all. I was ready, had my coffee and spent my time with the Lord and instantly phone call. My husband's like, I forgot this and this and this. Can you bring it? I was like, Sure I can. Instantly. And, and I didn't mind. My heart was to do whatever he needed me to do. But I will tell you, instantly when you are trying to focus your mind on seeing God and living in that, everything in the world will pop up in front of you. I guarantee you, somebody in this room was arguing before they got to church and walked in with a smile. If you hadn't this Sunday, it would be another Sunday or one you can remember. I can remember being kids, I'm telling off on my mama, but I can remember being kids, she chased us around that house trying to get us all straight. She had two boys and me, and she tried to get us all dressed, my daddy dressed, everybody ready to church, and I tell you how on earth she could walk in the church with a smile after she threatened the life out of us 500 times, but she would. See, I think, church, we have to look at what Christ is teaching his disciples, and we're that next band. We're right down on that mountain. And I don't know about you, but I want to hear him fully. I want to hear him. I want to walk towards him. And I want his words to resonate with me. Because I want to see him. I want my heart pure. And I know that it is going to take so much work. And God, thank you for working on me and my heart. But then he says, blessed are the peacemakers, y'all. Like, how much harder can he make it? I mean, really, now we're meek, we gotta, we've, we've got to seek righteousness and hunger and do, but I'm going to tell you, he's not making it hard, he's just telling you what's coming. Amen. Because when you start doing what he tells you to, and you start living this way, and you start focusing on him, and you move the distractions, you can't help but want peace. Yes. You can't help but want shalom for the world. Peace is not about passivity. Please hear me say that. Peace is about really resting in the Lord, in God, true shalom. Amen. And it makes us want to be peacemakers. When we become peacemakers, he says that we will be called children of God. He's amplifying more and more how richly are, we are going to inherit the kingdom. Because here's the thing. When you came to my mom and daddy's house, you could get in the fridge and you could go to the bathroom, but there were still places that were off limits. They didn't have to say it, but there were some places that were off limits. But I'm telling you, as you live into this, as you allow God to refine you, 
He gives you more and more open doors to the kingdom. He unlocks more and more of his kingdom for us. And I need you to know that the kingdom of God is not just in the future. The kingdom of God is here and now. Amen. Here and now. It's our gift now. We don't have to wait to the other side of glory to unlock it. Amen. Because here's the thing. When you start opening the gifts that the Father gave you the keys to open, you find that those gifts are more powerful than you ever knew. It is an upside-down way of thinking. His kingdom is upside-down from the way this world does things. And I'm going to tell you the peace, the joy, the love, all of it that comes when you start doing it his way. Oh, my word. Just try. I tell you what. You want to know, try it. I'm going to tell you it is a phenomenal thing when we start living for the Lord. And here's the thing that's going to happen to you when you start walking for Jesus. When you start putting your eyes on Christ. All those things that want to distract you, all those worldly things are going to pour in at you like nobody's business. Because I'll tell you what, people know when you're walking right with God. Because they know there's something different. I'll tell you, last night I was on a live and one of my friends was a little foul mouth. And you know what? He's like, oh, sorry, Pastor Jesse. One of the ladies said, he's scared of you. I said, oh, he's scared of the Lord that I represent. He recognized his spirit, told him that wasn't right. Praise be to God that God is working on him. But you ain't offending me. You're fine. Be who you are because I can't walk with you if you're not truthful. And I'll tell you, that's the thing. Like, other people probably would have said something rude. You know, how dare she? Why are you, why are you worried about what she thinks? It wasn't about that at all. It was that he recognized that he was not walking and talking holy. And he fixed it. And he, he apologized to the Lord. Jump not me. And people will start to persecute you when you do that because misery loves company and they want you to stay in the pit with them. And I'm going to tell you that they're going to try to say things. You know how many times I've heard, well, you just turned into a holy roller, hadn't you? You know how many friends I lost when I became a pastor? All of a sudden, I wasn't invited to picnics anymore, barbecues. People thought I was just there to bless it and move on. They had fun after I left. I'm like, I'm like, can I not be at the barbecue? Can I not laugh? Can I not tell jokes? Can I not have fun too? But I'm telling you, they know we're set apart. They just don't understand it. And sometimes because of that being set apart, they will persecute you for it. They will call you holy roller. They'll call you things. They'll, they'll leave you out. But take it in good stride because we're in real good company. There was tables that Jesus wasn't invited to. And there's, there's picnics that the disciples probably wasn't invited to either. Because Jesus goes on to say, Blessed are those who, persecute, who are persecuted because of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when you are insulted or pers people persecute you or falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Now, I'm not saying when they run their mouth about you for any other reason. I'm talking about when they come at you because you're a Christian. Jesus says rejoice and be glad about it. I'm not going to rejoice and be glad because somebody being ugly. But I will rejoice and be glad because they recognize I was a Christian. And that I walk different and I'm set apart. Because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Church, Jesus taught a whole lot on that mountain. 